So we'll take a look now at the last question, question four. Um, the name of the company referred to in part of the scenario is Ecoma. The first eight marks, again, are for discussion around environmental, social and governance. There are two extra marks there for clarity. You could probably get one of them for just using a couple of sensible subheadings. Um, there's no particular structure that you must follow with this. So it would be very open marking. But when you're looking for ideas, if you struggle for ideas on a question like this, again, you could give examples of environmental stroke social disclosure and explain how they would be useful. We can all say CO2 emissions, social disclosure, again, things like the way that you treat staff, the way that you treat suppliers, so things like payable days. You could pluck words out of this scenario. In particular, it talks about regulatory demands. So again, so the attitude of regulators, whether they are bothered about you make these sorts of disclosures. So often, if a company is listed on a stock exchange, these disclosures may become compulsory. In addition, of course, the other word is market demands. So whether it's useful to investors, investor needs, You would certainly want to mention two pieces of knowledge. One is the fact that it's core to integrated reporting, which as you know, the ACCA is very enthusiastic about. And the other one is mention the existence of this body, the GRI, Global Reporting Initiative. If you've not come across them, Google them. Have a look at what they do. Essentially, they tell companies that want to make these disclosures what to disclose. And they give examples there of the sorts of reports that companies could produce. So mention those two. If you're looking for discussion type words, to me, there's nothing better than this mnemonic, Fred, ran under the Chelsea viaduct. In the framework, it says that certain qualities must be presented by information. So present information of which you can give faithful representation that's things, isn't it, like no bias. Information should be complete and accurate. Information should be relevant in confirming what happened in the past and saying what would happen in the future. It should be understandable to users that it should be produced on a timely basis that it should be comparable to other years and other companies. And again, it should be verifiable. So someone else professional could come along and reach the same conclusions. I use those characteristics of information in all discussions. So I think that would give you a decent idea. So think about using some of those words like relevance, again, to just beef up your argument. The rest of the question was much more, of course, about accounting treatment. 
So in particular in part B, first of all for six marks, we were asked to comment on a provision in respect of the provision for the move and also again to think about a sublease I think three separate occasions in the same exam they're testing your knowledge of provisions because this standard is so much bread and butter. Key message though under the general provision of course is that you cannot make a provision for operating losses. You just can't. There must be, as you know, a legal or constructive obligation and that legal or constructive obligation is from a past event. So we must be able to make a couple of points in there. On the sublease, the other point where they are effectively again no longer need this le this lease of head office so they're going to sublet it to someone else um i would be guided by the printed answer that your tutors produce in an exam kit i wouldn't worry terribly at the moment about um the acc answer because standards are changing all the time so i'm not going to get into any numbers on the sublease all I'm saying about the sublease is that when they move out of a property that they're leasing, it's an impairment indicator. So there is an impairment indicator. And that is, they no longer need the lease. So the impact of that, therefore, is that there'll be a reduction in profit or debit and there'll also be a reduction in the carrying amount of the right of use asset. So say when tutors produce um, answers on that, have a look at those for the numbers, but otherwise I wouldn't heavily get into those numbers at all. Certainly not today. The next part of the question was much less controversial. It was asking us to account for a pension scheme. And at that stage, you should have been saying, Mummy, I've come home. Very easy way to pick up marks here in terms of the pension. So just set down the regular points in terms of pension accounting. We're asked to advise and include calculations. So a lot would be about explanations. So the explanation of what happens in the soft P, what happens in the profit and loss, and also what happens in OCI. So soft P, profit and loss, and OCI. Remember, in the soft P, we recognize the pension assets at fair value and the pension liabilities, which is an actuarial calculation. Actuaries, as you know, are very wise people with brains the size of eight watermelons. We don't have to do the calculation. We just have to notice that they do it. Profit and loss will show all service costs and also the net interest cost. And OCI will show the unexpected changes After that, 
then it's all about how things are actually presented. So then we can move into the calculations. We're not sold separately, the asset and liability. We're just told the net liability. Remember these old defined benefit schemes tend to be in a net liability position. So we can't reconcile the asset and liability separately. We can only recognize, reconcile the net liability. But the message is, isn't it, that in the soft P, we've got two years. And those two years, which I think are X5 and X4, you've got the net obligation, which I'm copying from the scenario, 78 and 59. In the profit and loss, you've got the service cost. And again, you've got a current and a past service cost that are dealt with identically. I tend to put them in brackets, but um, you don't have to. So I think that was 18 and 9. The net interest cost the opening rate isn't it on the opening liability so the opening rate in that scenario was 5.5 percent the opening liability was 59 so the profit and loss charge again drops out as 3.2 or whatever Finally, in OCI, you've got the remeasurement difference. Sometimes people call it actuarial difference, and that would need a working. In terms of the working, well, the usual working, but you're combining the asset and the liability together. So the brought down figure from the balance sheet for the liability is 59. Service cost, you've got two. 18 and nine, that's 27, increasing the liability. Net interest cost also increases the liability, 3.2. Contributions, which you're used to seeing increasing the assets, will actually decrease the net liability. The contributions coming in were 10. Then remember, we miss a space. The carried down figure at the end was 78. So if you add that through, and I've got that right, I think I have 86, 89, 79. Yeah, there's a little remeasurement difference there. It looks like 1.2. That's the remeasurement difference. And that's the figure then that would need to go upstairs. Again, to be reported in OCI. There's the pension. Very nice straightforward pension question. Finally, if we come across here, the very last two marks were just about adjusting the profit. You get follow through marks here, don't you? So you don't need to worry whether all your numbers so far have been wrong because you'll always get those two marks. So for example, again, you've got a draft profit. The draft profit, it tells us was 25. And then adjustments, whatever you've determined above, that would make that profit go up or down, a very straightforward two marks at the end of the exam 
no right, no wrong on that. You're just indicating. I suspect in the model answer, it's a loss. Doesn't matter, does it? And there we are. That's question four. So have a look now through the whole of that exam again. Just notice what's been tested there. Sometimes students get frustrated that there wasn't really any share-based pay. There wasn't any hedge accounting. And they're saying, where's the difficult stuff? What the exam is trying to do is to replicate what happens in life. Ordinary directors who, you know, the ordinary things for dinner, come and ask us ordinary questions. And that's what we have to prepare for. Thank you for listening to this presentation.